I count it a, a, a supreme honour at, at any opportunity to open up um, the words of eternal life and get to declare and proclaim them. Um, it is no little thing whether you're called to be a preacher or called to be a faithful witness in your um, home to your children or to the schools or to the people in your street. When you get to speak words that echo the heart of God, um, you are speaking words... When God speaks, universes come into existence, right? When God speaks, dead people come to life. And so when you get to echo and agree with and say amen to the words of God and how you repeat them, it is no small thing. And Don, I want to really appreciate um, you know, your courage in letting somebody else come up here and just um, speak. Um, I, I have been to the conference over the last couple of days and I know that I've met a few of you already um, who were there. I've recognised a few of you. And I know personally for me, we were... I felt the sense of the challenge um, to commit myself to a moment in time for gospel renewal, for, for the gospel to take root in my heart in a way that it, maybe it hasn't before and to produce fruit in my heart and my life that maybe I haven't seen before. And we heard their moving um, sessions of, of powerful preaching of God's word. And I had countless conversations over the course of the three days where I heard testimonies of God's redeeming work in various parts of Australia that just so warmed my heart. And, and yesterday I even got to sit on a panel and I heard all the other people on the panel um, telling incredible stories, exceptional stories about the way that God is at work in churches just like yours, all over Australia. Some of them really big and some of them really small. And it was, I found it inspiring. I found it inspiring. But if I can also be really honest with you, I also had the tendency in those moments to find it a little bit depressing. I get a little bit discouraged. And it's a bizarre conflicted emotion of both being incredibly inspired and also struggling with discouragement. And, and don't get me wrong, I, I love hearing the stories of how God is at work, but sometimes I've heard those stories and I've wondered, but how come I'm not seeing those stories in my, in my life, right? In, in my town, in, in my church? Or I read the accounts of the early church fathers and I hear about the wonderful moves of God in history in the days of old. Or, or the apostles, right, as they spread out from Jerusalem, taking this life-changing message of grace with them. And I hear of churches planted and of families transformed and of communities turned upside down and all overthrown by the gospel of grace. And I hear about those stories and I wonder, Lord, why not me? Right? Why are these other people's stories and not mine? Maybe you've thought that. Maybe you've asked questions like that. And it struck me that the question that we should be asking ourselves is what was it that fueled the early disciples' bold lifestyle of gospel witness? That's the question that we ought to ask ourselves. And is that fuel available for us? Or maybe a different way of asking that question, and this is the pessimist side of me, People tell me I'm a little bit pessimistic. I just say I'm not. I'm, I'm realistic. <laughs> um, but here's the pessimistic side of that question. What are the reasons? What are the reasons we don't boldly and effectively live a lifestyle of gospel witness? What are the reasons you don't? What are the reasons I don't? And I want to see if that we can get to the heart of both of those questions which I think, in essence, will drive us towards a common conclusion. So here's, here's a statement. It's, um, we're going to talk about the fuel 
for effective evangelism. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. The fuel for effective evangelism. But I, I just quickly want to qualify the word that I just used, that, that word evangelism. Uh, let, me, let me qualify that for a moment, because that single word in a room like this where I'm going to assume, dangerous to assume, I know, but I'm pretty confident there's a whole bunch of Christians in this room today. Um, and when, when we use the word evangelism, when there's a whole bunch of Christians in the room, I can guarantee you there's a whole variety of emotions that you just felt. Um, when we use the word evangelism, there are some amongst us, they feel the emotion that, that word provokes is excitement, and their response is, let's do it, right? Let's go. Some of you are doing that, but not all. Some of you hear the word evangelism, and the emotion that you feel is fear. And your response is, I can't do it. I can't do it. Some of you hear the word evangelism, and the emotion that you're feeling is shame. And you're saying, I know I should do it, but I don't. Some of you are even feeling uncertainty, and your response is, how do I... How do I do it? And, and some of you may be even feeling concern when you hear the word evangelism, and you're saying, should we be doing it all? I mean, who are we to tell them what to believe? Probably many other reactions that you could have to this one word, evangelism, but let me explain what I mean by the word evangelism. Evangelism is the deliberate presentation of good news which both informs and demonstrates to people what God has done through Jesus Christ to restore our severed relationship with himself. I'm going to say it again. Evangelism is the deliberate presentation of good news which both informs and demonstrates to people what God has done through Jesus Christ to restore our severed relationship with himself. Now, if I'd had the time, I'd love to break those down a little bit further and spend a good amount of time on them, explore them, but in summary, I simply want to just make these comments. All right, evangelism is deliberate. It's not passive. Evangelism is presented, it's not assumed. Evangelism carries the tone of good news, not condemnation. Evangelism informs, it's not just a vague, unspoken concept like it's gospel this and gospel that and gospel this and, right? It, it actually informs, it's demonstrated. The gospel is demonstrated, is not a disconnect between our message and our lifestyle. And it's about what God has done through Jesus Christ. It's not about moral reform and it's not about merit-based salvation. But we're not here to flesh all of that out. What I want to do is what fuels it. Right? What fuels evangelism? That's what I want to know. What was it that fueled the early disciples' bold lifestyle of gospel witness and what can fuel ours? Okay, if you have a Bible with you, I would love it if you could pull it out. The fifth book of your New Testament is most commonly known as the book of Acts. I'd love for you to find it, scroll to it, whatever type of Bible you use. You might notice, though, that many Bibles include its more formal title. So before you find chapter 1 or any other chapters in there, have a look at the title page of the book of Acts. We always just say the book of Acts, but, but most Bibles put the Acts of the Apostles. That's its most formal name, right? Because the book of Acts records how the early church grew into a true movement of the gospel and it does so by recording or tracing the various ways that the early church leaders went about their ministry. However, it's, it's probably been rightly noted by some commentators that this book could be more accurately titled The 
acts of the Holy Spirit. Right? Because more than anything else, this book is a record of how the Spirit of God transformed lives, how it transformed cities, how he transformed people groups, and ultimately turned the entire world upside down. And so this is the first essential aspect of what, or more accurately, who, fuels effective gospel witness in the first century. God did, right? God did, through his spirit. And this reality is unmistakable from cover to cover in the book of Acts. Where the spirit moved, lives were transformed. But as a way of example, it may be... It can be seen most clearly in the lives of the disciples when we reach Acts chapter 2. So you're already in Acts, now I want you to find chapter 2. The conclusion of the Gospels and, uh, and the opening chapter of Acts describe the disciples as fearful, retreating, and private. And I've got to admit, those three words have often or could often be used to describe me as a disciple. Fearful, retreating, and private. But then comes the single most defining event in human history. God not only lives among his people, right? He, he's done that, He's done that throughout the Old Testament by first having his tabernacle, then his temple, and even in the New Testament as we read the Gospels, God was present among his people in the presence of Jesus. But now, God would not just live among his people, but he would live within his people. At Pentecost, God takes up residence within the lives of his own children. And when God does this, new creations occur. So look at what happened. I'd like you to read with me. I'm going to read from Acts chapter 2. Um, we're going to read a, sort of a, a couple of blocks of this little uh, passage. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version, if you can follow along the best that you can. Acts 2, 1 to 6. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. All right, skip down to verse 12. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, these guys are hammered. That's not in the ESV, but they are filled with new wine. It means these guys are hammered, right? But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. Right? This is the Peter, remember, who only days prior, only a short time earlier, had refused to even align himself with the idea of Jesus. When a servant girl questioned whether or not he could have been one of Jesus' companions. Like he called down every single sailor's curse that he could remember to try and prove just how much not like Jesus he was. This is the Peter who said, I'm not with him. I don't 
know him. And now, this is the Peter who stands with the eleven and calls out, men of Judea. And so begins the most profound declaration of the gospel in front of thousands of people. And from that moment in history all the way through and beyond the pages of Acts, it has been God who has fueled the fires of effective gospel witness. Right? It was true for the earliest disciples, and guess what? It's true for us as disciples. Without the Spirit, our best efforts are little more than hot air and vapour. So we need, we need an awe-inspired wonder at the presence of God. We need an awe-inspired wonder at the presence of God. I think one of the modern-day problems within many churches has been the emergence of a practical theology of the Holy Spirit that has reduced him to little more than a, a power supply for victorious Christian living. Phrases like tapping into the spirit have become popularized. And, and they carry with them the idea that somehow the Holy Spirit is kind of like some divine battery bank that we carry around for when our phones are going flat. Books have been written on the subject of unlocking the key to the spirit-filled life, which makes me feel like all we need to do is find the right combination of cables and adapters to fully experience some secret state of Christian living. I carry around a, um, a man purse. You know, um, my wife got sick of me saying, can you hold that for me? Um, I'd walk into church and I'd be like, hey, can you help hang on to that? And, and one day for my birthday, she just bought me a man bag. And she went, carry your own stuff. Um, half of my man bag is filled with adapters and cables. I go places and people, oh, have you got a uh, cable to charge? I'm like, yeah, I think I do. You know, stuff everywhere and you're always searching for it. And, 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 oh, that's not the right one. And, oh, that's the old lightning one. Now I need a USB-C. And is that USB-A? And then you... How many of us do that with the Holy Spirit? We're just like, if I can just get the right connection, the right type of prayer, the right sort of posture, or the right sort of something, then maybe there'll be some secret life that I, I can unlock and hook into and get power for. And You see, the, the problem is treating God like he's our own personal power grid. Listen, when, when Jesus talks to his disciples and he says to them, hey guys, in a little while I'm, I'm going away, and they freaked out. Right? He said, in a little while, I'm going to the Father, and they absolutely dropped their bundle. Oh, hey, what, what, hang on, what do you mean? Right? When, when the disciples' fears were overcoming them, Jesus did not calm their fears by promising them a battery bank. Instead, he promised them what? A companion. A comforter, a guide, a helper. Right? A lifestyle of effective gospel witness is fueled by awe inspired wonder at God's presence. At God's presence. And that's why, when I've preached this sermon other times, I have a title up behind me generally. The title of this message is You Will Not Share what you do not treasure. You will not share what you do not treasure. I know it's true because people always talk about what they love. People always talk about what they love. Right, I'm going to break gender stereotypes and tell you that recently I found a new cleaning product that has absolutely transformed the half an hour or so a week that I spend on cleaning. <laughs> These little magic foam block things, they're, they're white, they come in a little packet, you get them from your, whatever favourite store you like shopping at, and 
It doesn't matter if your kids have drawn the wall with crayon, texter, whiteboard markers, you just get this little white thing out and you rub it on the wall, like 30 seconds, it's gone. You can't even tell it's there. And I've told people about it. It's like, you should get these things, it's called magic. They're great, right? Absolutely transformative. Um, other men in my church are more manly than me, and they, they come and they say to me, oh, Chris, mate, um, have you tried that new fuel additive? Like, you can get it from Bunnings or something, you know, and you pop it in your car and you'll get more power and better mileage, just like the best thing that you can ever say to another bloke with his car, the four-wheel drive, you know? Better power, more mileage, mate. You just put this little thing in your fuel, it's awesome. You should try it, it's the best thing out, right? People talk about what they love. All day, every day, and you don't have to give them a five-week training course on how to do it. They love it and they tell people about it. Or maybe you, maybe you were one of the first people that discovered that new cafe that, that opened up on Peel Street. And, or the little, am I allowed to say whiskey bar? Is that all right? Okay, the little whiskey bar there that I discovered the other night. Um, I wandered into it and found, I was like, this place is cool. And, and I got to the conference and people say, hey, have you got any nice places to eat? They were out of town. I'm like, I don't know about eating, mate, but you should try this whiskey bar down there at Peel Street. It was awesome, right? And I was telling people, it was, it was pretty cool. Um, the point is, if you love it, you tell people about it. No one has to tell you to do it. You don't sit there just going, oh, I wonder if I should... Um, oh, I just asked you permission if I could talk about whiskey, but... Um, what's true of these temporal things is also true of eternal things. You will talk about what you love. You'll talk about what you love. A lifestyle of effective gospel witness is fueled by an awe-inspired wonder at God's presence in your life. The story of Acts is saturated with people who are continuously beholding the wonder of God's presence in their life. They are overcome by his grace, right? They are astounded by his love. They are enraptured by his kindness towards them. And what's the result? They are willing to do anything, even if it means spending their own life, to let as many people as possible know about this amazing grace. I want you to listen to how Paul explains this principle to his friends in the city of Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says this. In their case, the God of this world, the God of this world, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, who ourselves, with ourselves, as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So in its most basic sense, these verses tell us there is only one significant difference between unbelievers and believers. And you know what it is? Have they seen the light of of the glory of Christ. Have they beheld? So if the book of Acts is really best described as the Acts of the Holy Spirit, then I would add this, that it is also a record of those who beheld him. Chapter after chapter, verse after verse, this concept is used. Behold, behold. They beheld him, right? Take, for example, Paul, that once religious terrorist who came face to face with Jesus while en route to kill Christians. What was it that transformed him? It was beholding the glory of the risen king, right? I mean, it was so bright, 
it blinded him. It knocked him off his donkey, literally. That single encounter, that one singular moment of truly beholding Jesus, it transformed him. Paul had beheld the risen Jesus and now the entire trajectory of his life was altered. A lifestyle of effective gospel witness was now fueled by the awe-inspired wonder of God's presence. Much later in his life, as he was saying goodbye to some really close ministry friends, we get this little insight into his life. It's it found in Acts chapter 20, verse 22. And um, Paul's on a beach talking to his friends from Ephesus who had travelled down to meet him. And he says this to them. He says, and now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem. Constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. I want you to notice two significant realities about this very short farewell that gives us a deep insight into a life that is fueled by awe-inspired wonder at God's presence. Verses 22 and 23 of that little passage that I just read out to you reveal the planned direction of Paul's life. Hey guys, I'm leaving. And, and there's a pretty good chance I'm never going to see any of you ever again. I'm heading to Jerusalem. And the Spirit's already told me, it doesn't matter which city I go to, I can expect hardship, persecution, opposition. But verse 24 reveals what motivates Paul for this action. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what to expect. But there's something that's driving him forward and motivating him in that direction regardless. And it's what? Did you notice it? I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself if only I may finish. If only I might complete my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to do what? To testify. To tell, to proclaim that which I love, the one that I love, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. All right, are you still kind of in Acts chapter 2 somewhere? Find that, we're going to finish this off a little bit. What happened when Peter finished preaching? Like, this is the Peter, remember? Like, timid, retiring, fearful, private. God moves in. The spirit within. God within. He learns to, to wonder. He learns to revel in the presence of God, to be awe-inspired. And it drives him to preach boldly, to testify to the grace of God in Jesus Christ. What happens? Acts chapter 2, verse 37. When they heard this, He'd finished preaching. This is all the people now. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? What shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, so this is like the sermon part two, this is like when the preacher says, I'm just wrapping up, and then they just dive straight back into it again. All right. With many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourself from this crooked generation. 
So those who received his words were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. We're not talking about just the next planet, Glenelg. We're talking about where in this city do we need more churches? We've got 3,000 people right now ready to go, right? Can you imagine that? Do you believe it could happen again? Which leaves us with the question, what about you and I? What about us? What are the reasons we might shrink back from a life of effective gospel witness? Maybe we don't share, because if we're honest with ourselves, we aren't enraptured with Jesus much at all. Maybe, maybe Jesus has somehow just become another accessory to enhance my life. Have we laid aside our attention to beholding the glory of God in Christ Jesus? Have we separated ourselves from abiding in the vine? Are we walking out of step with the Spirit. Maybe we do not share because we do not treasure. And if that's you this morning, if, if you are feeling some little prickling in your heart by the Spirit, maybe you find yourself right now within your spirit crying out like those in Jerusalem doing, saying, brothers, what shall we do? First thing, repent. We, we must be a repenting people. We must be. We have to be. Right? Own it. Own what you're feeling right now. I know it's uncomfortable. I know it's uncomfortable to be, to be prodded by the Spirit and saying, you are that man. You are that woman. That's uncomfortable, but we need to sit with that. Like, Don't rush past that. Own it. Confess it. Confess it to God. And can I ask you to be so bold to confess it to somebody else here? Well, take courage. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise God. So own it, confess it, and turn away from it. And then I would suggest if it's you this morning, you need to get on your knees. I need to get on my knees with a Bible open in front of me and continue crying out to God, Lord, I need to behold you. I want to behold you. Can, can you sweep the scales from my eyes so my blindness turns to sight? And fill me with a fresh vision of Jesus that reorders all other affections into their right place. Like, get on your knees. I don't mean that symbolically, metaphorically. I mean, if you have the ability to bend your knees, then do it. Get on your knees and call out to God and put a Bible in front of you. The next thing I would ask you to do is take an audit of your treasures. There's a very easy way to find out what your treasures are. There are three valuable resources that every single person in this room has, and we trade them all the time. In order of importance, they are these. Your time, your energy, and your money. I have people who come and sit with me in, in my ministry, and they'll say, Chris, can you, can you help me? I don't know what my treasures are. And I'll go, that's easy. Tell me what you willingly spend your time on. Tell me what you willingly spend your energy on. And tell me what you willingly spend your money on and I'll tell you what your treasures are. So take an audit of your treasures. Write them down. Put them in print before you. It's confronting, but, but do it. And then take that list and lay it at the feet of Jesus. Then I would ask you to reorder 
your time allocation, reorder your energy allocation, and reorder your financial allocation to represent your values more correctly, more accurately, to represent who you are as a child of the King and a follower of Jesus. And then I would say, you need to join another small group of disciples who are gathering on a regular basis midweek because it is hard to do this for a lifetime. It's hard to do this for a month. It's hard to do this for seven days, right? So we need to get with other people that are saying, hey, how are you traveling with that? Because I'm finding it difficult. And you say, man, I'm finding it difficult too. It's like, well, how do we keep each other accountable on this? Right, so meet with another group of disciples midweek. Start a, start a regular reading plan. I'm not asking you to sign up to McShane's or McMurray's or to some... Th- just start getting your Bible and reading it every day. Get an app that reads it to you while you're driving to work. Something. Just get God's Word embedded into your heart daily. And don't give up coming here every week. Don't don't give up gathering with brothers and sisters who will sing the gospel to you, who will preach the gospel to you, who will talk about the gospel over coffee with you. Right? Don't give up gathering. And that's all I have to say about that. (laughs) But let's pray. Lord, as your spirit does only what your spirit can do within our hearts right now, help us to not be people who are like someone who looks in a mirror, sees their reflection and walks away and forgets all about it. We want to be those who hear your word and obey your word. Lord, I pray for this church here in Adelaide. May may we be a people enraptured at the presence of God. And may that wonder fuel a bold lifestyle of gospel witness that many more people may know. That many more sheep may return. That many many more children might join us in calling out Abba Father. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty as we come and worship the Lamb. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his life. We thank you for his death, his blood poured out, his body broken. We thank you that... In this, as we remember him together, as we turn our attention and our affections towards you, Jesus, may you refresh us and spirit, will you embolden us to be your witness? Would we worship you?